Hi, I'm Tim Sales. Myself, along with Professor Charles King, who received his doctorate from the Harvard Business School and is a professor of marketing at the University of Illinois at Chicago, are going to briefly go through a business model for you that works. With this model, I was able to build a business that does in excess of $25 million out of 24 different countries. Now, that's not that rare, but I did it with no employees, no accounts receivable, no accounts payable, and no inventory. Someone recently said to me, that sounds too good to be true. My response back to him was, is that a good enough reason to stop looking? With all of the false promised advertisements today, like earn $10,000 a week, we hope you'll be able to recognize a professional business model when you see one. While you're reviewing this information, please keep in mind the business knowledge that this information is actually coming from. Professor King is not only the professor of marketing at the university, but he also has a very large consulting practice and has consulted some of the largest corporations in the world. Companies like Blue Cross Blue Shields Association of America, General Electric Corporation, General Motors, National Association of Realtors, Purdue University, Sears Roebuck and Company, Texas Instrument, U.S. Department of Energy, Westinghouse Electric Corporation, and over a hundred other large to medium-sized corporations. We highly urge you to sit back for the next 20 minutes and really comprehend this information. Upon completion, you'll be able to interact with your computer and our business model to get the most from it. Tim and I felt it important to begin the explanation with four principles of business that are essential to any successful marketing strategy. The first of the four principles is to have a huge expanding market. If you were the best vinyl record producer in the world, would it matter today? No. It doesn't matter how good you are in an eroding industry. Every year you would have to work harder to make the same amount of money. So the first principle is to focus on product or service categories that are huge and expanding. The second principle is to have unique and consumable products. I'll cover unique first. If you don't have a unique product, then you compete on price and convenience. Who has the best price? Who's closest to the customer? Yet if you have uniqueness, then people must come to you to get the product. If you don't have uniqueness, you must have a retention strategy to retain your customers. Next is consumable. If you have a non-consumable product, you're unemployed until your next sale. Success in business requires repeat sales of consumable products. Whether that's every time someone picks up the telephone, connects to the internet, renews a membership, turns on electricity, or gets to the bottom of a box or a bottle. You want those repeating commissions because they can pay multiple times for an initial effort. And the third principle is timing. Primarily here I'm talking about trends and timing. During all cycles of the economy there are people who are making money because of the trends and people who are losing money because of the trends. The money makers are the ones in front of large trends. The money losers are the ones who disregard trends. How do you get in front of large trends? Well, you study what creates them. Currently, the baby boom generation creates the largest trends in the world. The baby boomers are defined as a group of babies born immediately following World War II. So between 1946 and 1964, that's 18 years, there were 76 million babies born in the United States, a billion worldwide. They control 65% of all the money. I've likened the magnitude of all those babies being born to a basketball moving through a garden hose. See, if you can predict where this basketball is going through the garden hose, you possess the ability to make fortunes. Let's say it another way. If you can predict what a billion people are going to want to buy, you can make a fortune. I want to give you some historical examples of the obvious buying patterns of these boomers. To start off with, what do a billion babies need and want? What business would you want to be in? How about baby food? Well, Gerber sold almost two billion jars of baby food by the year 1955. What do a billion babies need and want next? How about shoes and toys? Well, Buster Brown, Kenny Shoes, Mattel, and Hasbro got rich providing shoes and toys to this young group. I could continue with this, but I think you get the picture. Let's jump way ahead to when the boomers are in their mid-twenties to early thirties. If you had a billion people in that age group, what business would you want to be in? 
That was in the mid-70s to early 80s. Well, that was the biggest real estate boom of all time. Why? Because a billion people needed a home of their own. Now that you're very clear on how profitable these boomers can be, let me also share with you how damaging these boomers can be. What happened in the late 80s to the real estate boom? Fell through the floor, didn't it? Why? Because the home developers didn't realize that the number of new home buyers were drying up. They just kept building houses. When you have a surplus, demand goes down. And that's what happened in the late 80s. The difference between being at the front of the basketball versus being at the back of the basketball is that when you're at the front of the basketball, you can be an average person and make very good money. But if you're marketing to the back of the basketball, you better be very good at what you do because only the strong and very talented survive. What's our point? No matter what business you're in, your business really should be looking at what industries are expanding and which industries are about to expand. We recommend that you not have a loyalty to something just because you were educated in it or because you've been doing it for a long period of time. So let's bring the basketball to present time, the mid-2000s. You've got a billion people between the age of 41 and 59. Let me put it another way. Every eight seconds for the next 18 years, someone turns 60 years old. What business do you want to be in? Don't go after the 41-year-olds. That's the back of the basketball. Go after the 59-year-olds. That way you've got a full 18 years of new people needing your product. Let's look at some of the obvious current and future trends. Health and looking younger are going to be tremendous trends. The boomers do not like what aging is doing to them, so products that fend off aging as well as vanity issues will boom. Businesses that focus on retirement issues will do very well. The crux of it will start with the boomers having enough money to retire. Legal matters such as wills and estate planning will become a very large trend. This trend will climb extremely fast because of the way boomers procrastinate. When the boomers start seeing their wealth fall into the hands of the state instead of where they want it to go, it'll kick this trend into the forefront if it hasn't already. Efficiencies will also grow. The television was too far away from the couch for the boomers, so they invented the remote control device. Today, they have their entire library of books and music in their cell phones. The boomers have always been enamored with technologies that make life easier. These technologies will actually create entire industries. The computer created the need for the antivirus software, and the Internet has created a need for identity theft protection and firewalls. As a side note, the baby boomers are not the only trendsetters. They are just the largest and have most of the money. As the world becomes one, the international market will play a big role, as well as the group born just after the baby boomers that are known as Generation X. But remember, the boomers control 65% of all the money. So when a bright Gen X person creates a great new product or service, they must make it simple enough that a baby boomer can understand it. Otherwise, that product will not reach mass acceptance. All right, let's move forward. The fourth principle of business is employ others so you get more done. There's really three main money-earning situations out there today. Number one, work for someone else, meaning someone employs you to do a job for them. Number two, be a professional, doctor, attorney, accountant, engineer of some kind. In both number one and two, you go out and you get an education in something and you exchange your expertise or knowledge for someone's money. The real problem with that formula is that if you are not exchanging any expertise, you're not making any money. So you end up running yourself into the ground working all the time. The most common phrase uttered by mankind today is, I'm too busy, I don't have enough time. So you'll run yourself to death until one day you do the mathematical calculation and you figure out that you're not going to get ahead doing what you're doing. Normally, people either hide behind the TV and pretend the problem will go away, or they start getting educated on what actually creates wealth. And the third and final money-earning situation is to own your own business. But the largest challenge with owning your own business is that sooner or later you're going to run out of time or talent. When you try to do it all yourself, you can't. You absolutely must employ others so you can get more done. By employing others, you're leveraging off the efforts of other people. You can get more education in your chosen profession and raise your wage a little bit. But true wealth is beyond anyone's reach without the use of leverage through employing others. 
Let me simplify this. Wealth is created by either people at work or money at work. For example, $5 million earning 10% interest yields approximately $500,000 a year or about $40,000 per month in residual income. You're leveraging off of your money. Your money is working for you. That's having money at work, which is the goal. But how does one get the money to put to work? By having people at work. Suppose you own a company and you employ just one person, me. I work for eight hours on Monday and you work for the same eight hours on that Monday that I do. Now pay close attention. You get paid on 16 hours worth of work because you take a portion of my productivity as income for yourself. You're leveraging off of my efforts because I'm your employee. So theoretically, the more employees you have working for you, the more leverage you have. That's people at work. However, have you ever had employees? If you have, you know that in theory hiring employees sounds like a great way to achieve leverage, but it's very difficult to reach leverage through employees. And the reason being is simple. No employee will ever work as hard for your company as you will because they don't own it. For you to have true leverage, you must create a situation where everyone has the same amount to gain. Then, and only then, will you have true leverage. Let me give you an example of this type of leverage, which is what the real estate and insurance industry use. Let's say that I'm a real estate broker, and I hire an agent named Robert. Robert sells a building. Robert earns a percentage of the selling price of that building, and so do I, the broker. Now, why do I, the broker, earn a percentage when it was actually Robert who sold the building? Because I, the broker, did some of the advertising, trained Robert, who is my agent. It's my office. I put up the risks. I did a lot of things. And so it's valid that I, as the broker, earn my money. But Robert doesn't work for me as an employee. He's an agent who works for himself. It's totally in the agent's interest to earn more money. This is a very important differentiation from an employee. If the broker wants to make more money, he or she simply needs to hire and train more agents. My point is that the broker and the agent have the same amount to gain from the sale of the home, which is a form of leverage for the broker. The broker has people at work, but not in the form of an employee. Agents are far better than employees, but there's still a problem with this structure. You may have already picked up on this problem with this structure. The broker can have multiple agents, but the agents cannot. The broker has leverage, the agents don't, which creates a conflict until the agents do what most brokers dread. What happens when I, the broker, have been real effective at teaching Robert to be a good agent? What's Robert going to want to do in a couple of years? Cut away and be his own broker, right? Is this good for me, the broker? No! Because as soon as he becomes a broker, two bad things happen to me, the broker. One is, he breaks away from me and I lose him as an income source. And two, worse than number one, he's now my competitor. Who trained this new competitor? I did. He actually knows how I run my operation, meaning he knows all my good stuff. By the way, this doesn't just happen in the real estate industry. It happens in practically every industry. Have you ever heard the expression, I'm just going to work there for experience? What does that mean? It means I'm going to strip them of their knowledge and then go do it myself. If you're a business owner, how many people have you trained who are no longer working for you? How many people have you trained to be your competitors? This gets worse. Let's say that Robert is now a broker right down the street. What will he do now that he's a broker? He'll go out and hire his own agents, right? And let's say one of those agents is named Linda. Linda also wants to be a broker. So she becomes a competitor to me that I indirectly trained, as well as Robert, who I directly trained. And this continues on and on. I, the broker, actually created this chain of competitors that I trained. Is this an intelligent way to expand business? Absolutely not. What if we did something entirely different? Let's say instead, I, the broker, am going to empower Robert to become a broker. I want him to become a broker from day one. Trying to hold Robert back or not showing Robert all of my best marketing methods is the wrong action. The only way you or I 
ever retain a true leader is to provide him or her with the same opportunity for growth that we have. Which is why I earlier stated that the only way to have true leverage is when you create a structure where everyone has the same amount to gain. So from day one, I'm going to encourage Robert to be a broker. And when he does, he doesn't break away from me and become my competitor. Robert simply shifts from agent to broker, which now allows Robert to hire his own agents, just as I have done. I'm going to continue earning a percentage of what Robert and his agents sell. And shouldn't I? I trained him. I put up the risk. It's my office. All those reasons I mentioned earlier. Now, the percentage I earn from Robert and his agent should be smaller than when he was an agent. But I should still earn a percentage. Why would I or you work with Robert's agents? Because it's in our financial interest. The more money that Robert's agents make, the more money we make. The more money Robert makes, the more money we make. That's our continued incentive to always help Robert and his agents. It's a win-win for all parties involved. Now some people look at this and say, gosh, isn't that one of those pyramids? And what's the perception of a pyramid? People at the top make all the money and the people down below do all the work, right? Isn't that the perception of a pyramid? Professor King, explain why this is not a pyramid and why people at the top don't necessarily make all the money. Let me make a quick point before I discuss the pyramid issue. It is not the geometric shape that people have a problem with. This geometric shape is probably the shape of your family tree. It's the shape of our government. To the architect, it's the strongest structure known to man. Every organizational structure in the world is this shape. So the shape isn't the problem. However, let me point something out about the perception people at the top earn all the money. Here's a typical corporation. At the top, you have a CEO, which stands for Chief Executive Officer. Does the president earn more money than the CEO in a typical corporation? Not normally. How about the president? Do any of the vice presidents earn more money than the president? No. What would happen if some of the vice presidents made more money than the president? Really, what would happen? Total confusion. This structure is called delegation. The reason why the president can tell the vice president what to do is because the president makes more money. Each level of the corporate structure earns less income. That's called a chain of command. The corporate structure is this. People at the top making the majority of the money and the people at the bottom do not. There's not anyone in the lower ranks of Kodak that gets a $25 million pay raise in a year. In fact, no employee even submits a resume requesting it. But the CEO can because he has people at work. The CEO of every corporation is leveraging off the productivity of all of the employees that work for the corporation. The unfairness is the CEO is the only one with leverage. In the model that we suggest as being more intelligent, you, the individual, are given the same opportunity to have leverage just as every CEO does. The structure that we've found that allows this is sometimes referred to as network marketing. Remember when Tim said earlier that to reach true leverage, you must create a situation where everyone has the same amount to gain? Well, that's what we just described. Tim's going to show you what makes the network marketing structure the absolute fairest structure available. In most network marketing companies, everyone can earn a certain number of levels deep in the organization they build. Everyone in the company can earn that same number of levels deep, like maybe four levels deep or six levels deep. There may be parts of a company's compensation plan that allow you to earn infinitely deep, but the majority of the compensation is normally limited to a certain number of levels. I'm going to use four levels for a quick example of why this is a more fair structure. If you build a larger or more productive organization than me, you would earn more money than me, even if you're in my organization. In the example shown, your second, third, and fourth levels are beyond my reach. And as you can see, the majority of your volume would be on the fourth level, almost as much volume as on the second and third levels combined. There are people in my organization right now that earn more money than I do. Do you know what I call that? fair. Shouldn't it be that way? 
Study any structure. Shouldn't the most productive person in that structure make the most money? Of course. Normally the measuring stick for compensation is an impressive resume or years of seniority. Well, what does an impressive resume or years of seniority have to do with productivity? Nothing. If you bring more profits to a company or organization, then you deserve more profits than anyone, right? Professor King, how did you become involved with teaching network marketing at the University of Illinois? In 1990, we had a major economic recession in the United States. The Midwest and Chicago particularly were very badly hit. As a result, the interviewers stopped coming to campus. We were graduating hundreds of students a semester, and they weren't getting jobs. Our alumni were coming back to us, losing their jobs, looking for help. We had nothing to offer. Now, I started looking, because of my background in business consulting, at alternative career paths. I went out and I looked at starting your own business and home-based businesses. I looked at franchising. I looked at direct selling. And in the direct selling arena, I backed into network marketing. Now, I was very cynical, skeptical. Tim, I was negative about network marketing. They don't teach network marketing at the Harvard Business School, and I didn't know much about it. The end result was that one of my students who was on the team asked me, why are you so negative about network marketing? I looked at that young man and I said, son, I know enough to know I don't want to know any more. That student looked at me and he said, professor, if I gave you that answer to that question with no more information than you have, you would give me an F. I turned to him and said, Son, you're absolutely right. I have no basis for that conclusion. You just made an A. As a result, we went to the library, we went to meetings, and for the next six months, we did due diligence on the network marketing industry. I visited the top companies. I talked to network marketing leaders. I became an evangelist. In 1990-91, we started teaching network marketing and the marketing curriculum at the university. Warren Buffett recently bought a network marketing company. If you don't know who he is, he's tied with Bill Gates as the richest man in America. He created his wealth by investing in and buying the very best companies. Why would he buy a network marketing company? Another question to ask yourself is, why would Microsoft or AT&T, Gillette, Colgate, Citibank, MCI, IBM, Toyota, Xerox, Texas Instrument, General Motors, General Electric, AOL, Netscape, Oracle, Sun Microsystems, Skytel, Coca-Cola, and many others distribute some or all of their products and services through network marketing. They use this method to distribute products because network marketing is a very efficient model to distribute products and services. These large corporations are firm testimony to the industry's success and credibility. The majority of these corporations have started working with network marketing companies just in the past few years. This confirms what Professor King was saying about the industry has come of age and is now a true profession. Think about why it's a good business decision for these corporations to distribute their products through network marketing. Consider the steps it would take a company like AT&T to get a cell phone into the market. Number one is advertising. TV, newspapers, magazines, banner ads, billboards, mailings. How much money have they spent on these advertisements? Millions before one phone is sold. Number two is a call center. They need to hire and train a call center to field all the calls from their advertisements. How much money does that cost them? How many phones have they sold? None. The third one is sales reps. They need to hire and train the sales reps to connect the phone with the person. How much money does it take to hire and train that sales force? Salaries plus commission? A lot. How many phones have sold? None yet. Contrast this with AT&T who joint ventures with a network marketing company and all the network marketing company needs to do is send an email to all their brokers and agents or send a phone message and immediately 50, 75, 100,000 brokers and agents buy the phone. Then all these brokers start training the agents on how to market the phone. With the network marketing channel, when does AT&T spend money? Only when a phone is sold. That's why so many companies have been joint venturing with network marketing companies and why this trend is just beginning. We'd like to cover one last thing in closing, which we feel is one of the most important points. Have you ever noticed that there are people who earn $10,000 a year And there are also people in that same year who earn $10 million a year. 
They both earn their income using 24 hours a day, right? What does person one not know that person two does know? You need to understand the difference. If there's any place that I see people absolutely blow their chance of ever creating wealth, it's in their understanding or failure to understand the time productivity connection. I hear people all the time complaining that they're too busy and don't have enough time. People act as though time owns them instead of them owning time. This phrase I'm going to share with you is what I believe is the number one reason people never reach their financial dreams. It's easier to just do it myself than to try to get others to do it. Or it's quicker to do it myself than try to get others to do it. The reason people are so busy and don't have enough time is that they lack an understanding of what a powerful investment it is to train others so you get more done. People fail at executing this because normally it's not rewarding to train others your expertise because they'll take it and profit without you. But in network marketing you're rewarded exponentially for your willingness to train others effectively. When you fully understand the power of educating and empowering others so that you can get more done, you're truly on your way to wealth. Please memorize this quote. Wealth is hidden from those who must do it all themselves. Wealth exposes itself to those patient enough to train others. Suppose you have a four-year-old son. His shoestrings are untied. You've got a choice. You can tie the shoes for him. It'll be done quicker. Or you can teach him how. Yes, he'll ignore you. Have him hold one of the strings while you tie around it. Keep doing that for two to three weeks and he'll be trying to get the other string out of your hand. When he finally does it himself, his knot won't hold. Keep teaching. Soon, you will have built a little guy with pride and you've leveraged yourself so that you can get more done. What's most important here is that you understand that this is your teaching lesson. He'll learn to tie his shoe when you learn to teach him. I'm sure you've heard this statement by Lao Tzu. Give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. That's a great statement. But if I can be so bold, I'd like to add something to Lao Tzu's statement. Teach a man to teach his children to fish, he'll end world hunger. See, that is the missing element in our society today. We have teachers so that we learn, but we don't learn so we can teach others. Network marketing is the most ethical business I've ever seen. It actually builds people when done correctly. My point in all of this is you've leveraged yourself. Shoestrings are still getting tied, but not by you. That's because you invested your time by training others versus expending your time by doing things the quicker way or the easier way. That's what the wealthy know and implement. Now with that understanding you can see why we refer to network marketing as brilliant compensation. In network marketing what you teach and train others to do is to duplicate what you do which is to find and train others. This is actually multiplying you not just duplicating you. When you do network marketing right, there's nothing like it. Let me show you why. Let's suppose you're a workaholic. What's the maximum number of hours you could work in a day? 24 hours, right? What if you didn't sleep for a whole year? If you were to work a whole year without any sleep, it would equal 8,760 hours. But that's the maximum number of hours you could work in a year, don't you agree? I have about 56,000 brokers and agents in my organization worldwide. Let's suppose that all 56,000 people work just one hour out of a year. 56,000 people times one hour each equals 56,000 hours of work that I'm being paid on. Well, for most people to earn on 56,000 hours of work, they would have to work for over six years. 24 hours a day without sleep to accomplish what I could accomplish working one single hour in a whole year. Now let me throw something really ridiculous at you. Suppose all my 56,000 people worked one eight hour day in a year. Notice I didn't say work eight hours a day for a year. I said work one eight hour day in a year. 56,000 people times eight hours is 448,000 hours I'm being paid on. 
It would take most people working over 51 years, 24 hours a day, to do what I could do in 8 hours a year. 8 hours in 1 year versus 51 years. Doesn't seem fair, does it? It's definitely not fair. What's not fair is that you haven't understood this until today and other people have. But now that you understand it, take advantage of it. The difference between the wealthy and everyone else is not a mystery. It's leverage. You've got to understand that. And as I stated earlier, you have to either have money at work or people at work. And there is not a more win-win affordable structure available than network marketing. Is network marketing perfect? Of course not. Nothing is. Every industry has its good and bad. Network marketing just has more good than any other industry for the most number of people. Will it require you to work hard? Absolutely. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Because it's an investment of your time, not a waste of time like being employed by someone else is. In summary, wealth is created by finding a product or service that a lot of people want and need. Make sure you get repeat business off of it. Choose it by looking at the trends. Employ others so you get more done. Make sure that the way that you employ others doesn't cannibalize your company by training your best competition. And make sure you're offering the same opportunity for growth that you have to all those you employ. The next chalkboard you'll see has frequently asked questions that you can interact with on your computer. Professor King and I